So in this last video for this week, we're gonna look at how to use GMM estimation to estimate a load drift model. Uh, I mentioned last week that we can estimate the load drift model with GMM, uh, and it's going to be important to do so if we're worried about endogeneity and want to use some instruments. And so we're gonna look at how to do that. So let's first go back to what we talked about last week and remember our logit first order conditions. When we're estimating the parameters of the logit model by maximum likelihood, the first order conditions for, maximum likely, for the maximum likelihood estimator are that the uh, derivative of the log likelihood function with respect to each parameter equals zero. And here we have the expression for the log likelihood function. Remember, we're essentially just adding up the log of the choice probability of the actual chosen alternative for each decision maker. So for each decision maker, we find the choice probability of their chosen alternative, take the log of that, and then add that up over all decision makers. That's our log likelihood function. Um, and we want, you know, the first order condition says that when we take the derivative of that with respect to each parameter, it should equal zero. Well, it turns out we can alternatively express these first order conditions as sample moment conditions. I'm not going to work through the math here, but the tech, the, the trained textbook does that. So I'll, I'll refer you there if you want to see the proof of this equality. But we can end up with a similar, uh, uh, a mathematically equivalent expression if we assume that representative utility is linear then our first order conditions are equivalent to this expression here. So we're taking the sample average of y minus p. This is like our econometric residual. It's like how, uh, what zero one indicator for whether our outcome is, uh, for whether an alternative is chosen or not, minus the choice probability for that alternative from our model. So you can think about the thing in parentheses here as a, econometric residual, then we multiply that by data. We're going to have k of these if we have k variables in x, and these sample moments equal zero. So we can actually view these as being the, the, the sample moments as being the empirical analogs of these population moment conditions here. So just like we did with OLS, we're essentially saying, or we're exactly saying, that our data, our Xs, are orthogonal to the econometric residual. How different is the outcome variable from our fit outcomes from our model, which in this case are choice, choice probabilities. That's exactly analogous to OLS, finding the parameters that make our data and our errors orthogonal to each other. So we could use method of moments here. We have k betas, we have k x's. We can use method of moments uh, and we can just find which set of betas is going to solve these k equations. We have the same number of moments and parameters, method of moments, done. Of course, the logit choice probabilities are nonlinear. We're actually not going to be able to use uh, or you know, construct a closed form expression here. So we're going to have to use numerical optimization to find the set of parameters, those beta hats, that minimizes the method of moments objective function. So once again, this is just like the squared, uh, the sum of squared sample moments. We can construct this thing uh, and then use, use like an optimization function in R to numerically optimize this and find the, the, the values of beta that minimize this objective function. And that should give us approximately the same beta hat as we would have gotten just using maximum likelihood. The sample moments are identical to the uh, maximum likelihood estimator first order conditions. And so we should get, uh, you know, kind of to a first order approximation at least, there will be some kind of optimization error. So we might not get precisely the same numbers like down to every decimal point, but we should get uh, you know, roughly the same uh, estimates for beta using this GMM procedure as we did using maximum likelihood. There's not really any reason you would do this with GMM unless you are concerned about endogeneity and you need to use some instruments. 
So implicit in every in what we just said was that those those X's were exogenous. If they are not, then our betas are going to be biased and inconsistent relative to a kind of causal interpretation that we want to give them. But if we have some instruments, we'll call those Z's. So we've got this matrix of instruments, capital Z, some, some, some variables for every, every decision maker and, and or every alternative that are correlated with the actual data going in our model, but that are exogenous. That's what the instruments are going to be. They're going to be additional variables that are uh, exogenous, but correlated with our data. And I shouldn't say additional variables. Remember, if we have some variables in X that are exogenous, they can also show up in Z. So we can have the same variables, some of the same variables in X and Z. We just have to leave out the endogenous variables from Z, and we need to have some extra exogenous variables to put in Z. Well, if those uh, instruments are exogenous, then they're going to be orthogonal to the model residuals. So we can write down the exact, uh, a very similar population moment condition as we had before. It's just that now we're going to say it's not the data, not our independent variables that are orthogonal to the residuals. It's going to be the instruments that are orthogonal to the residuals. So once again, here in the bracket, we've got a function of data and parameters that in expectation equals zero, population moment condition. We can replace that uh, population moment condition. Uh, sorry, the pop, sorry, we can replace the population expectation with the sample average and get this sample analog uh, sample moment condition right here. Of course, we want to find the beta hats that make all of these things equal zero. If we have, so let me say this, we have to have at least as many exogenous variables as we have uh, independent variables. We have to have at least as many instruments as we have variables in our data. If we have exactly the same number, we could use method of moments estimation here. If we have more, more instruments than variables, then we're going to have more moment conditions than parameters, and then we're going to have to use GMM. Uh, so if we are in that world where we have to use GMM, we want to find the set of betas that, that solve these, uh, in this case, we're going to have L, a, a system of L equations, one for each of our uh, sample moments, if we have L Z's, then we're going to have L of these equations, but we only have K beta parameters. So we're not actually going to be able to ensure that this expression holds for every one of our L uh, sample moment conditions. So instead, we're going to use that two-step procedure that we described earlier. Uh, we're going to use this objective function, or, or we're going to use these moments to construct our objective function. That is, we're just going to take these moments and plug them right in here. And then what we want to do is minimize this objective function. Of course, this depends on W. So we're going to use that two-step procedure that we described uh, a couple of videos ago. First, we can uh, plug in any arbitrary weighting matrix here and use that to get consistent estimates of beta, which we will use to get a consistent estimate of this S matrix then we will you plug that in, the inverse of that in for W and, and, and then find the optimal GMM estimator. It's just working through everything we talked about with optimal GMM, we can apply that here. It's just that now we have these specific sample moments to plug into our objective function. Uh, and so we will look at how to do that. We're, we're going to rely on the GMM function in R to, to do a lot of the heavy lifting for us here. Uh, but we will look at how to do that in class this week.